with up to 85,000 children under the age of five dead as a result of man-made starvation in Yemen. We ask a former drone operator if Britain is complicit in war crimes. And UNICEF on the ground in UK weapons targeted Yemen gives us its take on the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And Britain's biggest police force advises not to drive into London, but it's not because 10,000 die each year in the capital because of pollution. Plus, it's happening now. Stop it, because it won't work. No, Britain's parliamentary speaker didn't publicly write off Theresa May's Brexit deal at PMQs. All this and more coming up in today's Going Underground, but first, in a week when Britain's intelligence services admitted they didn't act accordingly to stop the bombing of the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester, which killed 22, are others continuing to be killed because of so-called UK intelligence? This in a week of carnage in British-involved conflict from Afghanistan to Yemen. I'm joined now via Skype from Montana in the northwest of the United States by award-winning whistleblower and former drone operator, Brandon Bryant. Brandon, thanks so much for coming on the show. Now we have in one analysis a third of those killed in drone strikes in Yemen this year have been civilians, including children. Uh, much surprised? I would say that probably the numbers are a lot higher, actually. Um, in terms of uh, the reports that are coming out, you know, my leadership, one of the first times a mistake happened and I went to my leadership for reconciliation, uh, my supervisor told me to pretend it was a dog. So imagine that um, I killed a child at that point. And imagine the, the, you know, if they're being forced to report on this, they're being forced to give you a number, they're going to give you a number that they think is reasonable. And I don't think one life is reasonable at all. I mean, in any case, uh, according to the United States Constitution, uh, we should be giving people fair and free trials in front of juries. Um, and we're sitting there just demolishing an entire nation. Well, Britain's it's... exporting arms, of course, but sharing intelligence with the United States for the targeting of these drones, uh, given, I mean, perhaps what you're saying is an outlier. Uh, if, if, well, uh, should Britain be it, it, sharing intelligence? Well, I mean, this is where secret compartmentalized information kind of gets, um, needs to be brought to the table, because this is where people who should be men take responsibility for their own action. And if Britain is giving intelligence for the uh, the consummation of these people's lives, then yes, they're held responsible for it. There's no question about it. They've, they've, they've participated into it. And so if Britain is going to do something, then they need to, uh, to restore their honor, then they need to fess up to it. On the other hand, there's now a report that uh, Britain, which uh, it's denying, that they are in uh, links to the development of fully automated drones. You might have to describe to us what uh, what they are. Uh, the UK, I should say, has no intent, says it has no intention of developing them and does not possess any fully autonomous weapons. That's a troubling, troubling one because the hardware had already been put in to the drones when I had already been in there, the software had not been developed. And now we're 18 or 12 years later and we're looking at um, how th they were already in the process of developing it and look how much our technology has gone. So we have artificial intelligences and algorithms that know us better than God or Santa Claus. And it wouldn't surprise me if these technologies are being used over in Yemen and even tested on people. Um, uh, uh, civilians. And why do we want to give autonomy to any of this, right? Why would we want to give any of that to be out of a human being's hands? It, 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 it blows my mind. I was at a Geneva convention, actually, um, and they were, they were placing uh, drones and autonomous warfare loosely under um, cluster, mis uh, uh, cluster munitions and landmines. And I'm, I'm the only non-lawyer there. And the, the guy who opens the thing is like, we must discuss what law means. He can't discuss what law means when lives are at, the st at stake. And this is one thing that I, a chief petty officer told me um, once. He said, you know, always stand up uh, no matter what rank they are because a, a, a stupid decision is a stupid decision is a stupid decision. And, and the reason why you stand up to them is because lives are at stake, lives are at stake, lives are at stake. And I really definitely think that none of these politicians or people who are developing these technologies understand that lives are at stake. They're just, they're just sucking off the blood money. Well, the government and the military might say it would also provide more accurate targeting 
and it's uh, drone well, operators the, the, like the, 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 pro the problem. The problem is it's not the accuracy that they're worried about because the accuracy, like if we're going to look at just the imagery that is produced online, most people, it's it's illusion, it's fake. Like most people are fascinated by Kim Kardashian's ass and Trump's hair and they're just fake. It's just fake, right? Uh, the, the realness of the situation is, is that they want to develop this technology because a robot isn't going to hesitate. A robot isn't going to have feelings. A robot isn't going to, to sit there and wonder how what this person's life is like. They've already tried to develop human beings into that, that position. They've done studies that since World War I, uh, they've increased the probability of someone shooting and killing someone from 20% to 95% fire and kill rate with a 5% margin of error. And we wonder why there's 22 veterans a day that kill themselves. And then we punish the people that are speaking out against this. We have Julian Assange, who's trapped in the Ecuadorian embassy for holding truth to power when he's just asking questions. He's saying, look, this is what these guys are doing. Why isn't anyone stopping them? And they're punishing him. They've taken my son. They're, they've put a, a whistleblower in jail. Someone who is dedicated to serving her country, reality winner, is in jail for showing that there was interference with our elections. And no one's doing anything about this. Here in the UK, Professor Michael Clark of the UK Parliamentary Drones Group says that UK military personnel could be prosecuted for complicity in US drone strikes. But if we forget for a minute the uh, complicity and, of course, all the, all the deaths uh, because of drone strikes, uh, what about the mental health impact on those that do the killing or facilitate it? So this is, this is something that I've spent a lot of time researching into because you know, as I, as I realized, especially since um, you know more than one third of the deaths that we're we participating in, it's like so. I read this story afterwards. My 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 therapist actually gave me this story, where in the bombing of Dresden, uh, you know, the pilots were just pushing bombs out of the uh, back of the aircraft. And afterwards, they just thought that they were hitting targets, right? And afterwards, they were shown uh, pictures of the destruction and of the people that uh, and lives that they were affected. And many of them were committed afterwards that had flown that mission. And um, she said, you know, and I read Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning uh, at one point. And, you know, it's all about it, we do cause a lot of uh, destruction and and what we should realize in this is the the harm that is caused to us is because we're separating from the intrinsic value of, of uh, humanity we're not look even like this interview we're doing it over Skype right our technology is wonderful but most likely the the better connections between people are you know beyond voice and image are in person and if we're taking the the very sacred act of taking another person's life in battle if we're if we're destroying that ability to look our opponent in the eyes and saying you are worthy of my blade uh, or worthy of meeting death and I'm worthy of meeting her as well on this battlefield and only one or neither of us are going to survive we're taking that from these people it's only a matter of time before it, it just it backfires well I understand you were given an, an envelope when I got out it wasn't an envelope it was it, this what happened was I I knew that we had participated we had a database and um, I had read my uh, final EPR getting out and there was a number associated with it. Actually, there was a number associated with all of these things and I killed 13 people. I know it. I, I, I marked myself with it. I understand it. Um, but I didn't understand, again, the, the amount of devastation that comes with it. And I thought that my in my participation, it would only have been like a couple hundred, but it ended up being um, 1,626 individuals, uh, unnamed individuals, and uh, 748 high-valued individuals. So that's over 2,400 people that had been uh, personally, that we've, we've tracked personally uh, to be eliminated through this, right? And so I can only imagine the people's lives who, um, you know, I hunted down Anwar al-Awlaki, who was uh, uh, an imam. He was killed by the Americans and with his son, a U.S. citizen. Correct. Uh, his son, uh, uh, Abdullah Rahman al-Awlaki, uh, was killed two weeks later. And they killed him because they didn't want him to be a, um, a rally point for a cause. 
And uh, about six months after his death, I met my father for the first time on Easter. And um, he's a very much a religious man and uh, very, very uh, passionate about God. And I could only see his mirror in Anwar al Awlaki, especially since my uh, little brother at the time was 16, year old, 16 years old, and I saw no difference between them. And then what it solidified for me was when I was, when I held my son um, after uh, he was a, a year old, um, and I was looking at him, and I was I, I held him in my arms, and I, I know that I've denied that from another man and from an, um, other families. I, I've, I've talked to a woman who asked me personally, she asked, why did my brother and my husband have to die? And I, I've shared in her sorrow and her grief. And, and you know, those are the things that motivate us to continue speaking, um, you know, the, those deep, uh, personal interactions are what causes us to talk against the people that are in charge that that they, they don't they don't understand they, they haven't they haven't looked at this stuff this tragedy or suffering in the face and, and tried to, to mend it right um, and you know this is where mr. Rogers we have this guy named mr. Rogers in the United States and he has this quote about always finding the helpers and my grandfather was a helper he was a minister and, and I want to be a helper. And, you know, we have people like Stan Lee who just died. And, and we, we honor the heroes that he has created by living as those heroes would expect us to live, right? We, it, you know, we, we, we are inspired by those things. And the part of the reason we have so much mental health problems, not only in the military, we have 22 veterans a day that are reported killing themselves from all this, all these conflicts. If, if more than one third of the civilians in Yemen are being destroyed, or, 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 or um, more than civilians, if I, I bet you it's closer to 90 percent. Imagine how many more veterans, when they realize the tragedy of what they participated in, like how they feel about themselves and, and why they're killing themselves. It's it's. It's a tragedy all around. Brandon Bryant, thank you. And we'll hear from UNICEF on the ground in Yemen, a target of US UK backed high tech weaponry, after the break, as well as this. We've tried marches, we've tried petitions, we've tried everything for protest, and now we feel it's necessary to take to the streets and disrupt. Today's culmination of two weeks of protests across the British capital, which have seen police advising people not to drive to London. And UK PM Theresa May again accuses Jeremy Corbyn of not reading at PMQs. All this and more coming up in part two of Going Underground. Welcome back. The US-UK backed war in Yemen has arguably been one of the leading causes of what is now one of the worst humanitarian crises in history, with 85,000 children dead from famine, according to a report from Save the Children, and 14 million further at risk from a de facto British-backed Saudi-led war. Well, I'm now joined via Skype from Sana'a by UNICEF's resident representative in Yemen, Merchal Rilano. Thanks so much for... Uh, coming on the show, hopeful the UN envoy Martin Griffiths meeting with the Houthi community can uh, somehow result in a ceasefire? I hope so, because I don't think that the children of Yemen can wait for much longer. 11 million of them are already in dire need of humanitarian assistance. And as you have seen in the media recently, more than 400,000 children are suffering from severe acute malnutrition. So this country needs peace now. Does the latest Save the Children, uh, they say conservative estimates of 85,000 children under the age of five dead since 2015. Does that sound reasonable as far as UNICEF thinks? Well, we know that the under five mortality in the country is 56,000 children per year dying of preventable causes. Those are children under five. Many of them can die, obviously, from malnutrition and malnutrition-related causes. Yes. And it's uh, on the media uh, appearing to be a dying of natural causes. Is this natural causes, this famine? No, we mentioned preventable causes. Preventable causes like uh, pneumonia, like diarrhea, like lack of food, lack of nutrients, those are preventable causes. Children that are dying of vaccine-preventable diseases. So they are not natural causes. They are man-made. This is a man-made disaster, very clearly. And why aren't uh, the children getting food supplies? 
the, the magnitude of the crisis is so enormous that despite everything that the UN agencies are doing, the families, they don't have any more income, they don't have any more food, there are no jobs, the civil servants have not been paid in more than two years, there is no more people uh, working in agriculture, the situation is catastrophic. And in addition, the economic crisis is increasing the prices of the very basic uh, goods such as fuel as and, and food. So you can imagine that families don't have any more money anymore to even buy the very basics. You see, the Saudis say that you don't need to import food via Hodeida, which is why they can, uh, the port can be bombed with uh, British warplanes and British weaponry, because there are other ports to import food from. Well, the main port in the country is Hodeida, and everyone knows that 80% of the humanitarian assistance is coming from Hodeida. So it's essential that the port keeps functioning, is open, not only for food, but also for fuel. And fuel is translated into water, and water is translated into life. If fuel is not coming to the, to the country from Hodeida, actually, the, few, the, the water facilities will not be working, and cholera will be again up in the agendas, up in the media again. Why do you think every time UNICEF or other agencies talk about all of this, uh, the bombing arguably increases on the port of Hodeida then? Our plea is for the parties in the conflict to sit in the table to, to take uh, a moral stand because the children of Yemen are dying. So it's, it's the, the moment right now for the parties in the conflict and all those that are supporting those parties to please find a solution to this conflict, a negotiated agreement, put the people on the, on the table and agree on, a, on, on moving forward, because the children cannot wait anymore. But you do congratulate the British government in giving uh, lots of aid to Yemen, what, even while it supports selling the bombs and, and warplanes. We thank all the, all the countries that are contributing to the, to the, to the humanitarian crisis in, in, in Yemen in terms of uh, the funding that they are providing to the humanitarian response plan. And uh, if the UN doesn't make a breakthrough with the envoy Martin Griffiths? Well, we need peace. So if, if it's not today, it needs to be tomorrow, because the, the urgency of the country, I don't know how to explain you, that the urgency is there, that many more children are going to die if peace does not take uh, uh, place in the country, if, uh, if an agreement is not reached. Rachel Rolano, thank you.